1855, Chief Seattle of the Suquamish tribe in the Puget Sound region gave a speech in response to a request from President Franklin Pierce that his tribe sell its ancestral lands to the government. Chief Seattle's speech, well, a speech that we thought was Chief Seattle's speech anyway, was commemorated on Earth Day and made into a famous children's book. That speech was an environmentalist manifesto in which Seattle agrees to sell the land if the white man will always respect the earth and treat the beasts of the land and the birds of the sky as his brothers. It was a stirring call to honor and respect the natural world. But alas, it was not what Chief Seattle said. It was penned in 1971 by a screenwriter named Ted Perry, who reportedly was appalled that his fictional speech was mistaken for the original. And when you think about it, it did seem a bit fishy, didn't it? We'll sell you our ancestral land if you promise to be a good environmental steward? Really? In the real speech, Chief Seattle made it clear that he had no intention of letting the white people off the hook. He would relinquish the land because he had no other choice. Your God, he said, loves your people and hates mine. He has abandoned his red children. Now we are orphans. There is no one to help us. Seattle did go on to say that if he would sell the land, it would be on one condition, that his people and their descendants must always be allowed to visit the graves of our fathers and our friends. These words cannot be taken at face value, because that condition was impossible. Seattle went on to explain, in the clearest possible terms, that the graves of his fathers and his friends encompassed the entire North American continent. Seattle wrote, at evening the forests are dark with the presence of the dead. When the last red man has vanished from this earth, these shores will swarm with the invisible dead of my people. There is no place in this country where a man can be alone. At night, when the streets of your towns and cities are quiet, and you think they are empty, they will throng with the returning spirits that once thronged them, and that still love those places. The white man will never be alone. So let him be just and deal kindly with my people. Stirring words, but why am I bringing up Seattle's curse now? Well, because the insights that we've gained in this course lead us to conclude that Seattle was right. Private ownership of land, in the sense of absolute private ownership or alienation of land, is not really possible. It's a myth, and society clings to that myth at its peril. We've recognized that land in the economic sense is the entire material universe except for people and their products. Obviously then one cannot have title or tenure to land per se, but only to a bounded piece of it. Legally, what land ownership amounts to is the title to a bundle of rights that attaches to a specific location. What rights are in that bundle is not morally absolute, it's debatable it is subject to society's legal control. In a deeper sense, though, we can see that Chief Seattle was warning us that the alienation of land leads to personal, spiritual alienation. Does owning your land make it possible for you to be alone on it? Can you forbid access to every trespasser forever? You think you can be alone on your land because it's your land and you can defend it with your gun. But on some level, you know that everyone has an equal right to that land. If you don't compensate the community for your exclusive privilege to it, then your sovereign ownership can never really be secure. Seattle didn't lay this curse on us, he just pointed it out. Woody Guthrie seemed to agree in this less known verse from his most famous song. There was a big high wall there that tried to stop me. The sign was painted at private property but on the back side it didn't say nothing this land was made for you and me in the last section of progress and poverty henry george addressed the question of how societies decline or advance he asked what is the law of social progress such a law he wrote must explain clearly and definitely why, though mankind started presumably with the same capacities and at the same time, 
there now exist such wide differences in social development. It must account for the arrested civilizations and for the decayed and destroyed civilizations, for retrogression as well as for progression. It must show us what are the essential conditions of progress and what social adjustments advance and retard it. Following logically from all his previous analysis, George identified two essential conditions of social progress, association and equality. Equality is something we all have a fairly clear idea of, but what did he mean by association? If you think about it for a while, you'll see that association is at the root of all those beneficial economic processes that we've been describing and exploring in this course. People come together into towns and cities, they cooperate and compete, and the whole community is better off. People write and speak, create music and art, and publish their works, and everyone learns. To see the great power of free association, consider its absence. The Soviet Union had great political and military power, but it couldn't stand under the weight of its own inefficiency and repression. Similarly, a society that inhibits equality is in all kinds of trouble. It ill-treats the people it keeps down, of course, but even the fortunate few must waste precious time and effort maintaining an unjust status quo. The more unequal a society is, the more effort it takes to maintain it. Probably the most obviously unequal society was the American institution of slavery. Yet there have been, and sadly still are, many societies that keep women in a second-class state of oppression and servitude. That is no way for society to move forward. Thus, to the extent that a society encourages, honors, and maintains equality and association, it moves forward. And to the extent that a society hinders or represses those things, it declines. That, according to Henry George, is the law of human progress. The institution of private ownership of land works against both equality and association. If some people are granted exclusive ownership of the land, while others must pay private owners for access to land, that is the very antithesis of equality. We've seen how often private landowners choose to hold valuable land out of use. That inhibits association to the whole community's detriment. What that means is that the Georgist remedy is essential for sustainable social progress. A highly skilled stage magician can make something huge, the Statue of Liberty, say, seem to disappear. Yet, if that magician were to actually start to believe in his smoke and mirrors, if he actually expected the statue to be gone, our feelings about his performance would shift from awe to pity. Modern economics has performed the astounding trick of making land, the natural materials and opportunities from which wealth comes, disappear from eco economic analysis. And alas, many have come to believe in their own illusion. If you had never thought about land as a, as a separate factor, of course, then its absence from economic consideration wouldn't ring any bells. People have been trained to ignore the meaning of land, and ignore it they do. This has profound consequences. Let's consider just a few examples. If private ownership of land is sacrosanct, then Malthus was right. The poor will indeed be with us always, and they will always breed faster than food can be grown. The urbanization of the poor south will continue. Misery will grow. Poor people will keep being born. There just won't be enough land to go around. Transnational corporations have every right to retain their vast holdings on which they pay local peasants starvation wages to grow crops for export. If private ownership of land is sacrosanct, then Keynes was right. The boom-bust cycle will be with us always. It can only be managed by governmental fiddling with fiscal and monetary policy, which grows less effective over time. Inflation will always overheat before all the willing and able workers can find jobs. Taxation will always place a dead weight on production. Real estate speculators have every right to enjoy the appreciation of their assets. It's their due, their pay for entrepreneurial acumen. If private ownership of land is sacrosanct, then Marx was right. In the capitalist system, there is an inherent structural tendency for the rich to get richer and the poor to get poorer. 
Those at the top will resort to it ever more dr drastic repressive measures to keep disgruntled workers in line. As the inefficiencies and dead weights of the system grow, regimes will resort to imperialistic wars to secure resources and profit margins. If private ownership of land is sacrosanct, then there really is a global race to the bottom. Nothing can be done to provide better opportunities for poor workers in developing countries. They need the work at whatever pay the multinationals are willing to give them. If nations want to develop at all, they have to play by the rules that set by multinational corporations. Land barons in those nations have no incentive to let go of their holdings to give workers better options. Why should they do that? It's their land. And finally, if private ownership of land is sacrosanct, then Dick Cheney was right. Terrorism will continue to escalate. People who resent our advantages and hate what we stand for will become increasingly desperate and dangerous, and we must do what's necessary to protect ourselves. Our very way of life depends on control over scarce oil, water, and cropland. Fortunately, we know that private ownership of land need not be sacrosanct. The alternative is not only viable, but infinitely preferable. We can replace our burdensome, invasive tax system with the public collection of rent. Doing so would confer a smorgasbord of benefits on society without compromising the efficiency of a free market economy. At one time, slavery was deemed a sensible, sound practice. It's even condoned in the Bible. At one time, it was taken for granted that women had no rights beyond what their fathers and husbands chose to grant them. Nevertheless, through the long years when such backward practices held sway, there were always thoughtful individuals who saw the denial of basic human rights for what it was. The most basic right of all is that to life itself. Yet if private land ownership is sacrosanct, then we are obliged to pay a landowner for access to the natural resources that we must have in order to live. In Progress and Poverty, Henry George thundered, private property and land is a bare, bold, enormous wrong, like to chattel slavery. So far, most people have been either too busy, too fearful, or too well served by the status quo to stop and think about the truth of those words. But they will. They will, because sooner or later it will dawn on them that nothing else is going to work. Thanks for watching, everybody. This concludes the Understanding Economics video series. I hope you've enjoyed it and that it's made you think and that it's made you want to learn more. And if it has, be sure to check out the website of the Henry George School of Social Science and be sure to subscribe to the Henry George School's YouTube channel.